Hi, my name is EJ Massa. I hate everything except ribs and video games. I only like old video games because the spark of nostalgia that pulses through my brains gives me subtle hints of joy in this fallen world. And to get the most potent spark, you have to play on a CRT. Using RGB SCART output on classic consoles to upscalers like RetroTINK is certainly a fun way to go on modern televisions, and heck, I've done my fair share of RGB mods. I have a modded NES, which is modded for RGB output in S-Video. I also have an SNES Junior, which I modded back in 2014 to have RGB output restored to it. You see, my childhood Super Nintendo has a native RGB output, but it's a bit blurry. But the Super Nintendo Junior has a much better one-chip video chip, but they took out the native RGB support, so you have to mod it to restore it. I picked up a cheap SNES Junior nine years ago, and I did that mod. Recently, I picked up this 24-inch Toshiba television that is beautiful. A local CRT modder tried to mod it for RGB but wasn't able to, but he did find a way to add S-Video to it, which it didn't originally have. And after seeing how it handles S-Video, I was like, wow, I've been screwing around with RGB for so long, but S-Video is probably 90% there. For those who don't know the difference, composite output is the yellow output that you see in most old electronics. It's a compressed signal on a single wire with ground. S-Video is less compressed with a color, or chroma, separated from the luma, or brightness information. And each of those signals, chroma and luma, are carried on their own wires for a higher quality picture. Then up from that is RGB, which is red, green, blue color information, each separated into its own wires for even higher picture quality. So now I have this beautiful CRT with S-Video being the highest quality option for input. And while my childhood SNES does output S-Video natively, the video chip in it isn't as good as the SNES Junior. However, the SNES Junior didn't have S-Video natively. While the video encoder chip inside it outputs it, they didn't wire them to the connectors in the back. And while I modified the SNES Junior back in 2014, I didn't think I would want S-Video, so I didn't do that mod. With all that being said, my goal for this video is to add S-Video to a couple of my systems. So here's my SNES Junior. I opened up the top and took out all the screws around the shielding here. Then I took out the board to work on that. Let me inspect my handiwork from 2014. And there's a THS7314 amplifier, which was needed to boost the RGB signal that the SNES Junior produces. I bought this from Retro RGB back in the day. You can get a similar amplifier from RetroFixes.com. Voltar's website also sells an S-Video and RGB version if you're thinking of adding both to your one chip SNES, which might be a great way to go. You can see how the amplifier chip is connected directly to the pin from the multi-out of the SNES Junior. They use the multi-output for many generations of Nintendo consoles. You can even buy a multi-out and add it to consoles that didn't have it, like my NES here. But I digress. For this S-Video mod, we'll start with this 220 microfarad capacitor. It has two sides, positive and negative. The negative is usually marked on the top, and the negative lead is often shorter. I soldered a 75 ohm resistor to the negative lead of the capacitor. The exact components I'll detail out in the description below. I then soldered a blue wire to the other end of that resistor. I'm using blue to denote luma, as the positive end of this capacitor will be soldered to the sRGB chips pin 17. I'll then prepare this 0.1 microfarad capacitor, which don't have a specific polarity, so I'll trim the leads, solder on a 75 ohm resistor, and then I'll attach another wire, which is red for chroma. I don't know why, but red seems like an appropriate color for color. Soldered the 220 microfarad cap to pin 17 of the sRGB chip, and soldered the 0.1 cap to pin 12. I slid some shrink tubing over the resistors of each of them and used a lighter to shrink that tubing. I threaded those wires through this hole over here and added flux to the pins that I'll be soldering to. I added a good amount of solder to those connections, soldering the chroma wire to the third from the left pin and the blue luma wire to the connection right under that. And that's it. Before putting it all back together, I tested the S-Video output and it works perfectly. And looks amazing. So that gave me the go-ahead to put the SNES Junior back together. And yeah, this looks way more crisp 
than my childhood Super Nintendo. Couldn't be happier with the image coming out of this thing. You can really see the difference on the upscaler. My original Super Nintendo is blurry, and the SNES Junior with the S-Video mod looks much more crisp. Apparently Voltar has a mod that makes the original SNES look as crisp as a one-chip SNES Junior. Might be something to check out for an alternate mod. One thing that you might not be aware of is that a lot of cheap S-Video cables, you know, the ones that also have composite connections on them, are actually not real S-Video, as it's patched from the composite. Usually real S-Video cables, like this cable from Insurrection Industries, only has the S-Video connection on them. And I use this Insurrection S-Video cable for most of my retro Nintendo consoles. But what if I want to do what Nintendo don't? I have my sister's childhood Genesis 2, but you actually can't add S-Video to this particular variation because they used a video encoder that doesn't have S-Video outputs. There are lots of Genesis 2 variations where you can, just not this one. I found this Genesis 1 at my local retro game store, which has the CXA1145 video encoder chip, and that can be modded to add S-Video. It also has high definition graphics, probably powered by blast processing. Now I'm not a Genesis variation expert, but I believe this is supposed to have some of the best sound of the Genesis variations. The Sega Genesis has notoriously bad composite output, so adding S-Video will be a huge improvement on this particular CRT. Instead of ordering some components on DigiKey, I saw this S-Video kit from console5.com, and I thought it'd be fun to install it. Let's see what's in the kit. Inside the package, they sent me a, a little atomic fireball. I always love little things like this. Comes with a little card with general modding tips. And here's the kit. You have variable resistors, an amplifier, and capacitors. They give you this very well-labeled board. You won't have any doubt where to solder any of the components in this kit. The kit comes with some input connections. I chose to get S-Video and Stereo RCA inputs. I opted not to get a composite input installed because composite is trash on this Genesis. Assembling this kit is brain dead easy. Slid the negative and positive leads of the caps in the clearly marked spots. Bent the pins to hold them in place, added some flux, and soldered them into place. Once that was done, I cut the leads and repeated that for all three caps. Next, the variable resistors slid into their respective slots, soldered those leads into place. No trimming needed for these components. Finally, the transistor goes into place with a helpful drawing on the board showing exactly what direction it goes in. Then again, soldered it on and trimmed the leads. And there we go, a tidy looking little circuit which will help get the S-Video signals off the video encoder. Now to open this guy up. Just gotta loosen up the screws. There's an old sticker for Game Zone blocking one of them, which won't come off easily. I wonder if it's the same Game Zone in Salem, Massachusetts. I picked this one up from Stateline Video Games in Holyoke, so it's been passed around the retro game store scene a bit. Couldn't get the sticker off right away, so the only way forward is through the sticker. And with that, all the screws are removed. I cracked the sucker open taking care not to tug the LED wire attached to the top of the shell. This thing is filthy and filled with what I assume is pet hair, or at least I hope it's pet hair. I'll definitely need to give this thing a scrub. Now you can bend the pins of the LED to remove it, but I just snipped the wires. I'll reconnect them later. Went around the metal shield and removed all the screws. I got to this screw, which has a tamper goo on it, so I'm definitely the first person to open this up since manufacturing. This screw is stuck, so I had to get some pliers to remove it. Needless to say, I won't be placing the screw back because I sort of destroyed it. Next, I went around this filthy circuit board and removed the screws, including the ones by the cartridge slot. With all those removed, I took out the board. On my version of the board, you can access the CXA1145 video encoder chip from underneath the board, so I can easily solder from the back. Now, there's many versions of the Genesis 1 board, so you may need to solder from the top, much like I did with the SNES Junior, soldering directly to the pads where the pins connect. I'd like to minimize the amount of drilling I do in this case, so I want to utilize this whole use for the RF connection for the S-Video port. But to do that, I'll need to take out the RF box. And to do that, I'll remove the solder from these pins here. I don't have a fancy desoldering gun. 
I'll have to invest in one someday. I just have this cheap Radio Shack desoldering device with a manual bulb to squeeze. Once the solder is removed, I lifted the RF box with a screwdriver and popped it out. I'll save that just in case I want my Genesis games to look like complete ass. And if I ever get that deranged, I'll solder it back in. With that RF box gone, I have plenty of room to place my S-Video port into that spot of the case. On the back of the board, I soldered a black ground wire to pin 1 a white 5 volt wire to pin 12, a red chroma wire to pin 15, a blue luma wire to pin 16, finally a purple mono audio out wire to pin 8. I fed all the wires through this hole here. A screw post goes through this eventually when we put it all together, so you have to be careful it doesn't pinch the wires, but there is plenty of space. I trimmed and prepared the wires to solder into the circuit board that I made earlier. And then I soldered them to the clearly marked pads, so black to ground, purple to mono in, red to chroma, blue to luma in, and white to 5 volts. I didn't bother with the composite video because it's trash on this console. I adhered the circuit board to this chip here with some electrical tape. I probably should have done this later after I soldered the other side, but oh well. Now to solder some wires to the S-Video port. I used this handy diagram on Console 5's website, and I soldered the wires using the same color coordination I've been using to avoid confusion. Black to the two ground pins, blue for Luma, and red for Chroma. I decided to use just one RCA port for the audio since only mono comes out of the video encoder chip, soldering the same color purple I used before. There are some mods to have stereo audio come out the back. I could use both RCA connectors, but if I want stereo audio, I'll just tap it from the front. There's already a headphone jack there. You know, I don't really care about aesthetics here, and I like to avoid unnecessary modding if I can help it. The RF hole in the back of the case wasn't quite big enough for the S-Video port, so I used a Dremel to widen it slightly. After that, it fits perfectly, and I tighten the nut to lock it into place. The RCA audio port fits pretty well in the square hole that was used for the switch to change which channel the Genesis would be displayed on. And despite jumping the gun, taping down the board, I soldered the S-Video and RCA wires to it, no problem, and I'm all done. I tested it quickly before closing it up, and I just needed to adjust the variable resistors to make sure the brightness and color were to my liking. I just used a tiny flathead screwdriver. Then I twisted the LED wires from the top of the case together and just covered them with electrical tape for now to hold them in place. Finally, reassembling the case and the mod is complete. The S-Video looks amazing, especially compared to the composite output. Here's what the Genesis looks like with composite and you can see that the image is soft. And with S-Video, the image is crisp. One note that you can't really see on video, but there's some very, very slight jail bars and some of the colors of the image, but on the upscaler, you can't even notice them. There are some mods that may fix jail bars or even replacing some capacitors may minimize them. But I have a philosophy with modding. The more mods I do in a row, the more chances I have of screwing things up royally. I know when to stop before I make catastrophic mistakes. These old boards are so noisy, I could do all the mods and it could be the same result, I don't know. And on this CRT and on the upscaler, the image is just so much better than composite that I'm extremely happy with how crisp it looks. Truly high definition graphics. One cool thing is I have a Radio Shack branded S-Video splitter, so I can play both on a CRT and capture the footage on a computer through an upscaler. So really it's the best of both worlds if I want to capture or stream retro content. If you're thinking about modding retro consoles, RetroRGB.com is a great resource. I've also bought a few kits from Console5.com and they also have great customer service. So check them out for capacitor kits, AV mods, and more. Let me know if you have any questions. There's a lot of details here, and I'll do my best to try to answer them. Until next time, bye.